Hi everyone and welcome to this week's cauldron. Tonight we've got Denise and Claire and um, Marion's not with us tonight and we're going to talk about how our week's been. Um, so Denise I'll come to you first, how's your week been? Um, well I have been on holiday this week but I still have been ke keeping up with what's going on in the UK and a few things have caught my interest. First thing I would say is Police Scotland. So it seems that the protected characteristics in Scotland have been redefined and they no longer include sex. I would like people to write to their MSPs and ask them to find out why they have only described five protected characteristics, disability, race, religion or belief, sexual orientation and transgender identity, which isn't a pr protected characteristic, it's, it's gender reassignment that's a protected characteristic. So they've got four of them and one of them they've made up. So I don't know where they've got these from because it's not exactly the same as the hate crimes bill because the hate crimes bill inclu includes age, and they put out a series of tweets which are actually quite threatening. This is what they say. Any crime which is perceived by the victim or any other person as being motivated wholly or partly by malice or ill will towards a social group. And the groups, as I said, have been disability, race, religion or belief, sexual orientation, transgender identity. Now, if you think about it, we know the abuse that women come in for online eh, from people for making perfectly reasonable statements about biological reality. And um, the fact that now these people are going to be able to report to the police. Now, this is exactly, exactly what was warned about by For Women Scotland, by Murray Blackthorn Mackenzie in the Scottish Parliament, in the committee stage. They warned that that this would be the consequence for women. And the consequence is that anybody who disagrees with your statement of biological fact can, can report you for a hate crime. And so um, this is, and these, these tweets by Police Scotland, I would say are a violation of our human right to free expression. This is a chilling effect. They're not telling us what we can and can't see. That's not included in the bill. What they're telling us is if anybody doesn't like what they say, all that has to happen is for that person to find a police uh, officer to take their complaint seriously. And we will, have a we will have a criminal investigation against us. So if that doesn't produce a chilling effect, I'm not sure what will. What I would ask people to do is to write to their MSPs and ask them why there's only five protected characteristics now in violation of the Equality Act. The interesting thing is, is why aren't the Conservative MSPs up in arms about this? Because, you know, they they're the government in Westminster and they believe in the union okay and they must believe in the Equalities Act so why aren't they saying that the Equalities Act in Scotland should be respected I really feel that they're falling down in their duties <laughs> so that's my Police Scotland uh, issue this week and I've got a few others I'll be talking about during the programme <laughs> Thank you, Denise. And what about you, Claire? How has your week been? Have you seen the uh, new advert for home insurance? Uh, yeah, I did post on that. Um, and that's just incredible, isn't it? It's just everything that's wrong with this ideology. You know, you've got, you know, it's, it's telling they chose a little boy, dressed him up as a stereotypical little girl, um, throwing glitter all over the place, carefree, etc. Um, and there's basically causing havoc throughout the house and no respect, nothing. Um, I noticed they didn't um, show a little girl whose breasts are, he's binding her breasts. Um, that wouldn't be quite as marketable, I don't think. Um, but I'm, I'm just horrified. But it's like jumping onto the bandwagon, of course. Stereotypes are regressive and we need to be committed to removing stereotypes. You know, kids can be anything they want, you know. I thought we'd got rid of all of this and it seems like this ideology is just um, reinforcing that in our children's heads. I mean, my daughter, for example, she didn't know anything about this till she went to school. 
And that's where she was taught. Oh, if you like um, football, which she does, um, has short hair, which she has had, you know, potentially they, they're saying to her that potentially she should, she could be a boy. Um, I mean, lucky for me, you know, she's very secure in her, her body. But imagine a child that wasn't, you know, it's it's very, very worrying. I mean, the thing I thought about that advert was almost like a metaphor for the gender debate. Mm -hmm. You know, you have this boy dressed as a girl, destroying everything, destroying everything in sight, throwing things around. And his sister, obviously worried, destroying her artwork, destroying <laughs> her, her work, her, her. And then the adult female looking on helplessly. It's also about parenting and, and, um, setting boundaries. This mother wrote that her 16 year old girl, she put a tweet and um, was, she had said, told everybody now she, she was a him and that she's a, a, using a boy's name. And the word, the mother said, I am worried sick. And she got an incredible pile on by people with no children, basically, <laughs> who said to the mother, let your child be whatever they want to be. Well, no, no, that's not what parenting does. Let your child do what they want. No, you don't let the child do what you want. You give them boundaries and you protect them. Protecting your children is what a parent does. So when my son at 14 wanted me to rent him a motorbike in Greece that he could ride on without his helmet. I didn't go, yeah, great idea. Here you are. I want you to be able to express yourself. I didn't let my my young, my daughter, when she was young, get earrings, you know, her ears pierced, because I was like, no, you're too young. So parents protect their children. There's a lot more you do to protect them than just that. You teach them how to, to navigate the world and the dangers of the world. And that's a parent's job. And these people without children were able to pile on to this woman and tell her she should let her child do whatever the child wanted. It's similar to this John Lewis advert, just a child can do what they want. And that is not healthy for, for anybody. And it's not healthy for a child. It makes a child very, very insecure. Uh, it's very bad for child development to not give them boundaries and not teach them. And it's also dangerous, you know? Why would you let your child do dangerous things? And I don't know if it's part of the ideology. I attended a talk yesterday um, and it was in relation to the school's guidance. I've actually recorded the entire thing. Um, there was two very powerful women there and they spoke, they were just phenomenal. Uh, one was Eva Comrie and she's a solicitor um, and she's like a specialises in child protection. And so she, she really knows exactly what she's talking about. She made complete sense to me. And another woman called Marin Smith. Now she co-authored um, an impact assessment of the first school guidance that went out um, and that went out and it was um, the, the child and young persons commissioner endorsed that there was issues and this impact assessment was produced to work out what the problem was now they actually found that the guidance was unlawful okay so the commissioner then got some lawyers in to double check that it was. They came back and agreed with Marin and said, yes, this is unlawful. And basically that then went through to the Scottish government who also ignored that, that, that guidance. Um, they got lawyers to check it. The lawyers also agreed with Marin, but they ended up publishing that because they felt not to publish it would damage the um the sort of standing of the guidance which so, are you telling me that the scottish government ignored legal advice yes well, that's a bit of a habit i mean basically they've determined that the guidance only meets the needs of all children if complaints are received and the scottish in, in the actual guidance like constantly throughout if there's a problem then you would look into this addressing the needs of the child now if that's in a document so many times that just becomes then it's not meeting the needs of all the children is it isn't it
Um, it also, obviously, we've talked a little about a little bit about the four-year-olds who can now change their gender identity, and that's keeping that a secret from parents. Okay, so that the teachers have been told that they can't tell parents that their four-year-old a girl is is identifying as a boy, and it's worse than that because the head teachers then have to remind parents if they are talking to the parent about the child they have to remember to use the the correct lie essentially now that contradicts completely the child's rights um because the parents we're meant to be there as you said earlier um denise to support our children and how can we possibly do that if we don't even know in what way they're vulnerable you know and also these are issues for things like, one thing that struck me was um, they talked about diabetic children and how when they get to a certain age, they get really rebellious and they don't want to take the medicine and that can be life threatening. Mm -hmm. Again, they can say to their teacher, I don't want my parents to know about this. And that is kept from parents. I mean, I, you know, you can just imagine. And the other thing is that it actually ignores the, the, all of the guidance ignores the concept of child development. So it it basically talks, um, as a guidance talks about transphobic bullying. And that can be down to things, I've written them down here, excluding someone from conversations, activities and games. Now this is in the context of four-year-olds onwards. You know, and we, if you've got say a 10-year-old, group of girls they don't want a 10 year old boy in their group and boys don't want their groups because we don't live in a utopia and children develop and as they get to certain ages then we start saying well actually you know it's kind or you know it's, you have to include people but when they're little like that you can't just tell them they do they don't understand that sort of stuff um and it also comes down, transphobic bullying even comes down to gestures, looks, and other non-verbal communications. And again, this is in the context of four-year-olds. So this, it's just, it doesn't actually acknowledge the difference in age and developmental stages. And I think the guidance really does need to do that. It also includes deliberately using the wrong name or pronoun. Now this bit, right, I mean, I'm trying to get my head around it, but the government have included uh, pronouns and the changing of pronouns in the guidance. And that allows for kids to basically, on a Monday, they could be she, her. Tuesday, they could be she, they. And Wednesday, they could be he, him or what. You know, they could change it every single day. And of course, some children are having problems keeping up with that. And they're getting into trouble at school for misgendering. And these children that are saying they're non-binary or whatever, they're having meltdowns. And, you know, you can go on to mum's net, apparently, and there are threads and threads and threads all about this. My child's got in trouble for this. And they really, it's a nonsense, but it is actually happening. And then there's the issue of autistic children. You know, they're not, you, you can't, you know, they can't be compelled to, to do this sort of thing. Um, and I, can I ask you, in the guidance, is it only transgender bullying or does it cover other kinds of bullying? But yes, I'm pretty sure, yeah, it was trans, in fact it is because it includes pronouns and everything else and that wouldn't be required for children that are not transgender. But I'm just wondering in general because, you know, there's a problem with like one protected characteristic being given this prominence and yeah. the others not. Uh, one of the biggest forms of bullying at school that I experienced, and I'm sure many children did, is um, poverty. You know, mm. if, uh, the poorer children get bullied. I mean, I was poorer and I was bullied. Um, and uh, also you may be bullied for other other reasons, like be pro possibly religion as well. So I'm just wondering why the, there's such problems prominence to transgender bullying when what percentage of bullying that goes on in schools is transgender bullying compared to all the other kinds of bullying there is. I've been watching, I don't know if you've been watching the Nolan podcasts on the BBC, I'm just working my way through them at the moment and they're basically saying that Stonewall 
has captured every organisation, our government. It's just everywhere, schools, police. And I think this guidance, going through the guidance, confirms that for me. Um, you know, the, the guidance is not protecting all children. It only protects all children if parents are complaining. So you've got a situation now. Can you imagine being 11 years old? You've gone up to secondary school and you're in a changing room and there's a 17 year old boy in there with you. What girl would have the confidence? I would not have, I would have died. I would have died. Or even in the toilets, you know, I um, had a condition called endometriosis, honestly, and it was an absolute nightmare. Constantly battling not to have the blood coming through and staining everything. And this was, you know, it was a really massive problem. And it, this is a big problem for a lot of girls. Can you imagine coming out of a, toilet and there's a group of boys there and you might even have blood on your hands whatever because you know that happened to me regularly or you might need to wash something and you've got a big group of boys or you need to get changed and you need to be naked a little bit what girl's going to be able to complain or say anything and then it, then you, obviously they can speak to their parents then the parents have to then go to school and that can cause difficulties I mean they are saying that you could go to MSPs um, if you felt uncomfortable going to school but the both women said complain 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 because that's the only way that all of our children will be protected at school um, and the thing about it is some people have complained and the school, I mean, this was hilarious. One woman was told, um, she complained about it. And when she went in to have the talk, basically the teachers told her um, that she was wrong, you know, and they wanted to dispel any um, misconceptions that she might have about the issue of basically boys in girls' spaces. Um, so, this, you know, schools are really trying to, frame it in such a way because children are now being taught in school um, that it isn't kind to bring up this sort of problem and they need to be respectful of people's identities so it's all being framed in a way that suits a certain agenda um, and it, it is it is really really worrying because you know it's not it's not normal to have boys in a girl's toilet and it's not fair to girls and it actually goes against their human rights. Um, and it goes against all of our safeguarding measures, same as not discussing issues with parents, like keeping secrets from parents. That goes against every safeguarding norm, sort of every usual safeguarding um, measure that would be in place. Why is that? Why are they doing that? It's, um, I mean, there's a UN Convention on the Rights of the Child gives girls the right, well, gives girls and boys the right to privacy. And that's being denied to them through the use of this guidance. So I think it will be really interesting for people. I think all parents, please watch the two videos that we pop up. Um, but also talked about things like sport. Um, the, apparently the Scottish government had a pilot um, and it was an attempt to increase girls' participation in sport. And the first thing that they were told was that girls want their own sports. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want to do sports with boys. They were categorical in that and they want to be listened to. Because um, currently trans identified children, can't believe I'm saying that, they choose whichever group they're comfortable in but girls have no say non-binary they get to choose as well and gender fluid they can just decide week to week I mean it's can you imagine trying to um, navigate this as a teacher teachers are really stressed out there was actually quite a few teachers there last night um, and they know they're failing children but they're afraid for their jobs because if they say anything they are then reprimanded and even at risk of losing their jobs. Um, and, you know, this guidance is non-statutory. And so I think that's an important point as well, because the buck will stop with head teachers um, because they are the people responsible for choosing to teach that. 
Um, and there are alternatives. There's transgender trend and there's um, sex matters. They've both produced safe and effective guide, guidance on the teaching of this stuff. What the government have published um, is, is not fit for purpose. That's exactly the words they used. Um, Thank you, Claire. Well, actually, I would just like to add a happy note into the end of that. So I was in London this weekend and we were speaking, there was debates, we were at Battle of Ideas and it was amazing. Like I was able to have debates with people. I was able to put my points across about gender ideology, about, about so many different things and nobody was judging you. And it was like a total safe space. We were able to say this. It didn't matter what you said, you could disagree and people disagreed with me. And it was just, it was great. And it made me remember Scotland used to be like that. And I hope it comes back one day, which now kind of puts me onto the thoughts of poor Kathleen Stock. Have you got something to say about that, Denise? I am completely supportive of Kathleen Stock. She's a doctor of philosophy who's a lesbian as well. And she has been suffering this like horrendous abuse, victimization, <laughs> threats of violence. She has now has to have police protection. And these children who are abusing her and victimizing her and bullying her they are being enabled by the society in general so we have the labor shadow all right get all this right shadow minister for equalities and hope she's always going to be shadow and never the actual secretary for equalities or else we're really in trouble now we know labor is really, really bad on women's rights, really bad. But this is about lesbian and gay rights. What she's what the what the shadow minister has done is she's taken the fact that Kathleen Stock is a member, board member of LGB Alliance. And she's used that to criticize and um, say very um, untrue things about LGB Alliance. So what, what she said basically is that they're not for equality, which is ridiculous because obviously they are for equality, but they're for same sex attraction. And also she says, you know, that the LGB Alliance don't believe in the use of puberty blockers on children. Well, yeah, exactly. They don't believe in the use of puberty blockers on children. Right. <laughs> and they, they say they, they don't believe in RSE teaching which yeah well they actually don't believe people, children should be taught uh, that they're born in the wrong body but luckily luckily the actual minister for in universities in the government in the UK government is actually says where once we had debate and critical argument we increasingly have physical threats and often complete intolerance of all opposing ideas we say the attack on Kathleen Stock was unwarranted and extreme harassment. So thank goodness that is the Conservative, the Conservative Universities Minister. And that quote I've read you out was tweeted by lesbian Labour. So it shows you that when the lesbians in the Labour Party are turning to the Conservative Minister for Universities, and their own shadow minister is talking utter, utter homophobic nonsense when they are in trying to do down a group that is formed to protect same sex as a protected characteristic. Homosexuals are attracted to people of the same sex, not the same gender. And LGB Alliance know that. So I think that's an interesting thing here where you can see that the Conservatives are actually on the side of homosexuals and women and children in this debate. And Labour um, and the SNP and the so-called progressive parties are <laughs> opposed oh, oh, and harmful oh. and dangerous to yeah. women, same-sex attracted, and children. Children go to university to learn, <laughs> yeah. And academic freedom, uh, I mean, it allows um, people to discuss sometimes very problematic things. Yeah. That is part of it. I mean, you know, you have to discuss, you have the debate, um, and they create, you know, they write papers, and they persuade people. And you either persuade people of your argument or you don't. But these young, arrogant, 
entitled, disrespectful kids that are attending now. They feel it's their job to re-educate their professor. I mean, how utterly shambolic is that? No discussion, no debate. And if she doesn't agree with them, they, they feel they're going to cancel her. Well, they're not going to be cancelling her because we will not allow that. If this is allowed, that is the end of all academic freedoms. As kids should be reprimanded for what they've done. It's harassment and they deserve to be punished for that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, th I think that's the biggest thing. It's the idea that you can no longer base reason on facts, facts and reason yeah. and logic. And yeah, we can have count. But you have to debate them. You know, it, they no, don't. No, you're not allowed to do any of that. You're not allowed no. to, to bring up actual facts. You're not. How, how to dare debate. you bring facts into a debate? Yeah. It's almost like you're. It, we're in a dark age. When it's this is now a religious belief, uh, the belief in queer theory, gender ideology is a religion. It's like burn the witch. It's exactly what they're doing to women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was going to take everyone's final thoughts for the night, and my final my final thoughts, sorry, are I am running for council for the, the local elections in May. Now, I would encourage everyone to. To, if you're going to run to show an interest as soon as possible because the political parties will be picking their local council election um, candidates really soon so whether you're going as an independent or you want to run for a party please get your applications and now start making a bit of noise start getting yourself known and do it now that I was going to encourage every woman or man that has ha wants to protect children and wants to protect women's rights the way to do it is to go and stand for council because it's only through political power that you can really make change so the idea about protecting every child at school making sure every ch child is protected that claire was talking about that can only you can complain to the school and you can you can do parent power and you can complain to the school. But if you're a councillor on the education committee, you can actually do something that will in, improve the lives of the children and women and the community. So I would would really it doesn't matter what party you're going for as long as they're the pro women. And if you actually think you could change the SMP or the Green Stands. <laughs> I don't think you will stand for council and hopefully if we can get a lot of pro um, sensible rational biology people <laughs> elected. Claire? So well my final thoughts it uh, goes back to the schools and what the government is endorsing in schools and there was a couple of things that really kind of upset me last night and um, one is the government is actually endorsing the use of breast binding, in, which I found incredible. Um, you know, that is known to cause um, rib fractures. Um, it can puncture lungs. You know, these um, breast binders, they're, they're very restrictive. They're actually really painful to wear. And the, the, the girls can only wear them, well, some girls can only wear them for set periods because they're so painful. They cause permanent damage to them. You know, it can actually cause permanent scarring. And surgeons who are performing surgeries on some of these girls that come through for double mastectomies, they are reporting that actually breast binders have complicated things very greatly um, when they're trying to remove these girls' breasts when eventually after all the social transitioning, after the puberty blockers and everything else. Um, when they go to finally amputate, to amputate the breasts, they're seeing significant problems um, there. Um, and apparently over half of the women um, who were asked about whether they had had problems with binders, half of them said they'd actually had two or more serious um, negative side effects. Um, and I thought that was really bad. And the second thing was... Um, teaching of porn in school is being promoted as a good thing with no mention whatsoever of the fact that it's an exploitation of women. Um, no mention of um, the sort of the changing nature of porn. You know, the last 25 years has seen porn go from 
you know, something that was probably mild, a uh, soft porn, to really quite horrific, uh, violent, and you know, horrible porn that I talked about the other the, the other day. Um, and it is really damaging young boys, especially. Um, but that has an up-on effect because it's having a measurable damaging effect on young people's relationships, like boys and girls. Um, and there's been a huge rise in violence within re relationships. So, you know, promoting porn as something fun and, you know, promoting masturbation to seven-year-olds, as, as you said, Lisa, you know, that your body can give you pleasure. Yes, it can. But these guidelines must be age appropriate. They must include parents. It can't be this hostile um, environment for parents. You know, we have to know what's going on in school. We have to know what's being taught. And this is what we must, um, you know, we must talk about. And I'll leave you with this sobering thought. In UK schools right now, there's one rate a day. This is in school, okay? And by age 16, six out of 10 girls have either experienced or have witnessed a sexual assault. And that's just in school. Wow. Um, and add to that the harassment outside of school. And as Marin said, it's endemic. It's everywhere in society. So if we are perhaps looking for a reason why young women are identifying out of their sex, not wanting to be a girl anymore, not wanting to grow up as into a woman, might we start thinking about why, um, you know, and sexual objectification um, and the threat of violence, um, I think is a hu huge part of it. And frankly, I think teaching porn to children, I mean, I believe one child, um, their homework was to find examples of soft porn, hard porn, and some other type. I think it might have been gay porn you know, or something like that, but it's just not appropriate. One woman in the audience, her seven-year-old, had come home to her one day and declared she's bisexual. It's not right. It's not right. It's grooming. That's exactly what it is. And actually, I can't remember which one it was, but they said, if your child's been been taught porn you should be reporting that to the police and I completely agree with that yeah I agree <laughs> well thank you everyone for watching and um look out for more bonus episodes from Claire and we'll see you next week bye bye bye, bye. Claire will be uploading to the Cauldron channel a video of the meeting that took place yesterday 13th of October on the guidance that, that has been issued to Scottish schools she will be also uploading a podcast which will have further details of this guidance. So if you want to learn more, please look out for the video and podcast. See you next week.